something went, um, something went wrong with the recording for the next class after yours, the happiness class, and I lost the recording. So I'm like trying to figure out what happened. But anyway, let me do a check in quickly. How's everybody feeling? Even outside this class, what's going on? This is summer one. What's happening? Is everybody all right? Or any questions about what we've been doing um, or the recent assignment, right? That's fair, right? Because now you hand it in. It's like, well, it's too late now, Professor. But <laughs> well, what was anybody have any questions about anything or are we okay for anybody? Happiness. I assume the silence is an indication that all is well. <laughs> that all is pretty well. Um, where we are, we're actually, you guys are doing great, doing really well. Um, we're actually getting to the um, meat and potatoes at the end here. The last, and the reason why you say, well, I only have three papers. Why do we have three papers? Because the last paper, which is personal to you, is going to be a little bit more, um, it's, it's something about the story, right? You'll see that. Because right now we were just doing the assignment that you guys had right. Make sure everybody understands. The last one that you just had was on, um, you know, tackle empathy, those types of things. Why is no important? You know, master the no. And, and we're going to do a little bit of that today. I missed. I missed the last. One. That's all right. It's on. It's on Blackboard and it's on YouTube for anyone to see, so you can have your friends make fun or whatever, whatever you wish. But it'll be fine. So. It's great. I saw it. I remember your name. I remember your paper. Actually, I do. Um, so uh, I think we're in a good place. Uh, not everybody's here. Not everybody can make it on Thursday or Wednesday, whatever it may be. But um, and the session was recorded and you can watch it. And if anybody has any questions. So let me ask before again, before we start, before we start the rumble, did anyone have any questions about what we've seen before? Right. What was the last thing that we saw? If we remember, we saw a man tell us how to do things. I call them instantaneous changes, right? Mark Bowden was the man who came and gave a lecture, a TED talk about um, how you can influence people instantaneously when you see them. Has anyone been so bold as to try it? I think you should try it. The best thing to do is walk down the street and see somebody you don't know and go, hey, and they go, do I know you? And you say, no, never seen you before. <laughs> like he said. And they will respond just like that. You, you, go, you go like that. He says, as he said, the eyebrow flash is the key. You go like that. And in fact, I've done it many, many times on my way to the grocery store <laughs> with the people waiting outside. They go, go like that. And they go, hey, how do you do? Do I know you? <laughs> You'll see. Just have some fun. You know, life is too short. We're, we're just kind of passing through. We're born, we transition, and in between, we decide how we're going to serve. And so I want, you know, a lot of you indicated in your papers in different ways and in your introductions and stuff like that, you know, you have your dreams about what you want to do with your life. And I'm hoping that you can figure out or just use a few core competencies that we learn here so that you can have the, and design the life that you want. Does that make sense? It's very, very important. All right, uh, just gonna wait another minute or so. If anybody has anything they're thinking about, Great. If not, then we're going to go right to the video. <laughs> Keep everybody interested. All right. Um, let me just make sure something. Let me see. Share the share the screen. If I do that, I want to see what we have up there. Uh, that'll be perfect. <clears throat> but are we all right? Does anybody have anything to say before we start, or are we good? We're good. All right. So let's start and let's see. Um, a video that I had, uh, it's very powerful because a lot of times in our lives, we may think we're going through poop, right? Or people around us might be going through poop. <laughs> and if you're going around, if someone around you has poop and if you have enough poop around you, you're gonna feel like you have poop on you too. So how do we change that situation? How do we negotiate the reality so that people feel better and we feel better and that we feel we can be the primary movers or shakers in our lives to change destiny? Right? So I kind of want to make sure that everybody can do that. I want you to know how to do that. And so now I'm going to share this brief story and then we'll come back and discuss it quickly and then we'll move on to the next one. So let's share together. Work. 
drop it down. Uh, what happened? You, can you guys are seeing something weird? Let's stop share. Something's happening. <laughs> well, did you see some kind of funky thing up there just now? Did it look weird? Because I saw it look weird. Let's try it again. Because that's not what's supposed to happen. Yeah, something definitely weird. Yeah, let's go here. Let's just, now you can see it, right? Something good. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? Everybody disappears. So let's look at this one. Here we go. Tell me if you can hear well. As you may know, one of my teachers and mentors was the late psychiatrist Milton H. Erickson. He was an amazing fellow and quite a storyteller. And one day when I was studying with him in the 70s, he told me this story and it was like being hit by a billiard ball. My whole life and my whole career took a new direction when I heard this story. And it really showed me the power of stories of how they can change people. And so this was a story about a guy who'd been one of Erickson's patients, and he was all messed up. He had really neurotic life, and Erickson, with his creative and unusual therapy, had basically sorted this guy's life out. From his mother becoming, being dominant in his life, he just had terrible problems where he had germophobia all the time. He wet his pants at his work. I mean, he was all messed up. Erickson did this really weird and creative stuff and helped him solve his problems. Well, about six months later, he called Erickson and he said, you know, you helped me so much. And he said, I've gotten out from the domination of my mother, but I'm still really close to her sister, my aunt. And he said, I know you're going to Milwaukee where she lives, and I'd really love it if you'd get a chance to go visit her. She's become really depressed. She's been in a wheelchair for the last couple of years due to an illness, and she's just withdrawn from the world, and I'm really worried about her. She's talking like she wants to give up, maybe suicide. And I know she's been depressed for a while. I talk to her every week, and I told her all about you and how you'd help me, and she's willing to talk to you. So when you go to Milwaukee, when you're done with your workshop, would you be willing to go over and visit her and see if you could help her? So Erickson uh, agrees to do it. And he travels to Milwaukee, and he gives this workshop. After the workshop, he goes and visits the woman's house. And she tells him her story, and he can see part of the story. Well, he rings the doorbell, and this is in the 1950s. Erickson had had polio earlier in his life, so he walked with a cane or canes, and she was in a wheelchair. Immediately, when she opens the door, she's heard about this Milton Erickson, but she didn't know he'd had a handicap of any kind. So they instantly bond, because in the 50s, if you were handicapped, you were different from everybody else. So she knows, he knows what she's dealing with. She has inherited a lot of money from her family, a very wealthy family, and she lives in this big family house that she's inherited with like 12 rooms. She lives alone. She's never married, never had kids. And she has enough money that when she got in a wheelchair, she had the house converted to wheelchair accessibility. So there's ramps all over the house. She's even, because it's a three-story house, she's even put in an elevator, a lift. And so she can get f up to the top floors. And so she's showing Erickson around. And while she's showing him around, she tells him the story of her life. She used to be really active in her community because she had, she inherited a lot of money. She didn't really have to work. She never got married. And she was very active in her church community and in social good in the community. And, but now in the last couple of years, it's really hard for her to get around. The world isn't wheelchair accessible. She has a guy who will, you know, drive her around and who does some handiwork for her, some gardening for her. And, but she doesn't really like to use them because it's a real hassle to get the, you know, the wheelchair and the car. And she doesn't go to church anymore because it's a real hassle. She barely goes and she's embarrassed about being in the chair. And she has to wait until services have started in the church and let him lift her up uh, to put her in the back of the church. And she leaves before the services have ended because she doesn't want to see anybody because she's, you know, she's embarrassed about the whole thing. And they treat her differently now that she's in the wheelchair. So Erickson hears all about this as she's given a tour around the house. Finally, she gets to the end of the tour. It's the, her pride and joy, the greenhouse, the plant nursery that's attached to the house. And Erickson grew up on a farm, so he shows a great deal of interest in the plants that she's growing. And he notices on the potting shelf in the greenhouse there are a bunch of plants up there with really small little leaves coming off. And he asks about them, and she points to 
one plant that's in the greenhouse, and see that they're all from that one plant. It's an African violet plant, and I've taken cuttings off, and I've gotten all these new plants going. And that's really hard, and Erickson admires this. This is very hard to make the cuttings and make sure that they start to grow. And so he turns to her and he says, you know, your nephew's worried about you. And she said, yes, I know. He thinks you're depressed, Erickson says. And she says, yes, I have been rather depressed the last few years since my illness. And he says, I don't think that's the problem. She brightens up and says, you don't? He says, no, I think the problem is you haven't been a very good Christian. Well, she came from a really moralizing family, and she's a little offended by this, defensive right away. But it, once he explains, she calms down a little. He says, no, you have all this money, all this time on your hands. You have this amazing talent with plants. What I recommend is you get your church bulletin, your church newsletter, and your church membership list. And any time in that church newsletter you see an announcement of a birth, a death, a graduation, an engagement, a marriage, uh, uh, an illness, uh, some happy or sad event in someone in the congregation's life, you get one of these African violet plants that you made, the new ones that you made, repot it into a gift pot, get this guy to come over and drive you to their home with your Christian and human presence, with congratulations or condolences, whatever's appropriate. And so once he explains this to her, she agrees. Maybe she's been kind of caught up in herself the last few years and hasn't really done the kind of charitable work she'd like to do. And she agrees to give it a try. Well, that was in the 1950s. I studied with Milton Erickson in the 1970s. And I was there with two other students when he told that story. And he said, go to the, he told me to go to his bookshelf, pull out one of his scrapbooks. And he instructed me to, to page to a certain page. And there was an article that was cut out from the Milwaukee paper from 1968 or something. And the headline was, African Violet Queen of Milwaukee dies mourned by thousands. They couldn't fit the people in the church that wanted to come from a memorial service because she touched so many people in the last years of her life, always being the one that showed up with the African Violet Queen, the African Violet plant, and with her congratulations and condolences and her Christian and human presence. And that story made such an impression on me. When the other students left, I couldn't afford to pay Dr. Erickson for his teaching. So I was out in the garden with him because he asked me to do gardening as part of our bartering agreement. And I was pretty intimidated by Erickson, but I turned to him and I said, Dr. Erickson, I was so touched by that story of the African Violet Queen. I want to work that way. But I'm in graduate school, and they're teaching me if somebody's depressed, I should get them on medications. I should do uh, background, find out what the history of depression in their family is so I can normalize it and under help them understand where it comes from. I should help them change their distorted thinking so they won't be so depressed. How do I get from those ways that I'm learning to this African violet way of working? That's what I, how I want to work with people. And Erickson, who was in a wheelchair by then in the 70s, looked down at the ground for a little while, and then he looked up and he said, I looked all around her life. Everything looked depressing. She lived in this big house all alone. She kept the curtains drawn because she was embarrassed about being in a wheelchair. It was dark. It was lonely. The only sign of life I could see in her and in her life were those African violets. He said, I thought it'd be easier to grow the African violet parts of her life than to weed out the depression. And then he sent me back to work in the garden. And that moment really stuck with me because I went on a quest. How do I find the African violet parts of people's lives to help them change and find new possibilities? What you think? Different way of looking at maybe, you know, stories are just stories until you realize they apply to you. But maybe it doesn't apply to you at all until you think about it. And then all of a sudden, you may think about your life in a different way. So when we talk, what do you think, what was something that you could have learned from that story that we all heard? What was the, what was the, what was your, um, what was, uh, people send me private messages. What was, um, <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> I'm with you too. Whoever said anything, it's all right at home, living the dream. Um, anybody, <laughs> what, 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 did, what did you learn from that story? If you, did you see anything or hear anything from that story? Anybody, do you want to share? Yes, yes, James. I mean, uh, I, it, I don't know if it's directly related to, to what, uh, where you're going with this, but 
it, it, it did seem like she had no, she felt like she had no purpose or meaning in her life. And he was able to give her back a way to find purpose and meaning in, in her life. So. Absolutely. One of the key things I want you to think about when we're learning, you know, you have to put everything together like a puzzle, tactical empathy, right? Labeling. He labeled her. I wasn't in the meeting and neither was this therapist, but he labeled her. He said, it seems like, you're depressed, or it seems like, right? That's the power of labeling. If you label properly and you build rapport with another human being, you can change their life forever. That's what I just said. Mm -hmm. If you label properly and you build rapport with another person, you can change their life forever. The question I keep asking, and I'm, why did I ask this question? There it, there it was, it said, uh, he said, look for the African violet in the person's life. I'm asking for you as a negotiator to look at the African violets inside of you. Mm -hmm. That sounds weird, right? That's kind of a weird thing to say. Mm, yeah. But there's an African violet inside of you. Remember, there's something inside of you that wants to get out. You have skills and sets. And what happens, the society tells you you don't have certain skill sets. And therefore, you're not as effective as you would be in communicating with other people because you've already believed that the history of the story they've told you about yourself isn't true. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm actually sharing this particular story, if you will, with you so that you can understand that there is something inside of you that wants to get out and wants to make a change. But a lot of times we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust ourselves. We don't trust what's happening to us. And so I wanted to get that dialogue going because we think about all, oh, I got to learn all these techniques. I got to learn all this stuff, but maybe it's not so much learning so much of stuff, but to be comfortable in what you are as a person already. Interesting. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to show you another one from that guy. Is that okay? Can we, can we learn something else? Another story? Yes, definitely. African violet story. So if you put down two words, African violet, remember when you're talking to another human being, find out what's growing in their life rather than finding out you're having a problem with your boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, your child. They're not doing what you want them to do. What do you find in their life that is growing? Because mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to take out the weeds. Does that make sense? All right. So that's the first story. Let's look at the next one. Let's look at another one. I give you guys so much credit. You guys are all the places battling. I love it. <laughs> Real world. Let's go. Let's share the next one. Same guy, different story. It may apply to you if you think about it. One of my teachers and mentors was the late psychiatrist Milton Erickson. And Erickson was an amazing storyteller. And one day he told me this story about when he was growing up in the uh, rural area of Wisconsin. He and some friends were playing in one of the farms and a horse ran in with his reins all askew. It had obviously thrown its rider. And uh, the boys caught the horse, kind of calmed it down, petted it a little. And the horse was now calm, but nobody knew whose horse it was. And Erickson said, I'm going to take this horse back to its owner. And his friend said, how are you going to do that? We don't even know whose horse this is. He said, that's all right. The horse knows. He jumped on the horse, he steered it out onto the road, and he spurred it on. And the horse started trotting down the road. It turned right when he went onto the road. And he spurred it on and went down the road. And every once in a while, it would stop and want to eat some grass on the side of the road. And Erickson would just steer him back on the road and keep him moving about five miles, which was a long distance in those days in the rural area of Wisconsin, the horse pulled in, turned to left and pulled into a farmyard. And the farmer came out and obviously heard the horse coming in and said, there's my horse. He said, he threw me a while ago. How did you know to bring the horse here? I've never met you before. And Erickson said, I didn't know. The horse knew. All I did was keep him on the road and keep him moving. And that for me was a seminal story about trusting people to know where they need to go. Obviously, it was a story about a horse, but Erickson was telling it to me 
because I was training with him to become a psychotherapist and a hypnotherapist. And he believed that people had the answers within, that it wasn't a great idea to impose anything from the outside saying, this is what you need to do with your life. But what we need to do when we're coaching other people, when we're helping other people, when we're facilitating other people is help them find their directions and their answer and keep them moving and keep them focused. So that story has stuck with me for many, many years. What do you think? What do you think he's telling us about that story? If you think about, it? you know, I'm. Why do you think I'm giving you stories? Did I talk about ABS formula before? You remember what ABS formula is? Absorb attention, bypass the critical factor, and stimulate an unconscious response. That's the power of stories. Mm. It's gonna be very careful. I'm giving you two short stories. A lot of times when you're going to do a presentation. Some of you, a couple of you work for Chase Manhattan Bank or the bank, and they're going to say, do a presentation. If you can figure out a story that would be impactful to people, it's going to absorb their attention and bypass their critical factor so that they listen to you differently. So the horse knows the way. I'm actually telling you, if you think about it, who knows the way? I'm the teacher here in this particular setting. In another setting, you might be teaching me something. I'm actually telling you, you already know the way. The things you're learning, you're actually sort of revealing already in yourself already. You don't have to have a thousand tricky things to do, but tactical empathy, mirror and matching, we do it naturally. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. It's important so you have to figure out how you know your nose. I'm not, I try to make things simple, not simplistic, but simple. All right. So anybody have any comments about that one? I want to ask a couple of things. Did I show you, a, a, did we actually watch a video about what happens? I call it my nose. I usually give it in the beginning of the semester or I give it in the, uh, in the middle or at the, like we are now. Did I show a, what happens in a dentist waiting room? Did you guys see a video about that already? Social conformity. At least they're having fun. Everybody's <laughs> if first someone's gonna have a nervous breakdown, I don't want it to be on my video here. <laughs> I want wait till afterwards in about 40, 40 minutes, you're okay. Right? I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding if something's all right. <laughs> I, at least people are having fun. I love it. I like I like to have fun and I hope you do too. I think the main thing that we need to know is this. Um, and a couple of people sent me some other things, some private messages, and I can say to everybody, um, you know, just work harder. Make sure you fill out the, you say, can I get a better grade? I'm always going to grade up. I'm always grading up. Just do as much work as you can. Work with the materials, you know, work with the materials, and I'll, I'll work with you. I'm not in the business of giving grades that you don't feel happy with. Forget me. I, I want you to be happy. Okay. And, um, all right, so let's watch the next video. Good. Right, so let's go. Let's watch the right. Here we go. Let's watch the next one. Mute everybody first. We're having too much, too much fun. Let's see. Let's do this. Uh, share. That's not what I want to do. Stop share. That's not what it is. I don't want to share that one. Let's do it again. Something happened. Let's go here. <clears throat> what happens is the video is sometimes hard to get rid of. All right, so uh, brain games. Let's watch this one. <clears throat> Tell me if you saw it. The reason why I'm asking you this is because it's going to be, if we don't know our nose, this is what happens to us. Oh, cancel, share. Here we go. Attention. Did you guys see this already? This crowded waiting room. These people may appear to be waiting for the eye doctor, but they're actually waiting for the first test subject in our hidden camera experiment. Did anyone see this already? And here she is, right on time for her 12 o'clock oh appointment. God. Okay, so the question becomes, what happens when we don't know our nose? What happens to this us in everyday life? She's here for a free eye exam. Have you been here before? 
No, it's my first time. What she doesn't know is that everyone else in this room is working for us. They'll be with you in just a couple minutes. Today, we're running an experiment on social conformity, and the test starts now. Did you hear that? These people sure did. It doesn't take long for our test subject to notice a pattern. Beep means stand up, but why? And if you were in her shoes, what would you do the next time the tone sounds? While you might think you make your decisions all on your own, when it comes to peer pressure, all too often, your brain is just following the crowd. It's all around you, every day, an invisible force you're probably not even aware of. It affects what you do, how you think, and who you are. It's called social conformity or peer pressure. And while it might not sound like a good thing, it's actually not so bad. The truth is your brain craves synchronicity and takes comfort in the ease and efficiency of just going with the flow. And whether it's simply knowing what to wear in the morning, supporting your team at the big game, or even marching off to war, we're all programmed to be part of the group. And that's because your brain knows that there's power in numbers. We set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this. Or would you? After just three beeps, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone. The crowd is gone and nobody is watching her except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Great, thanks. thanks so much. Everybody was doing it, so I thought I was supposed to. Think she'll teach the new guy what to do? We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. And slowly but surely, what began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. Here to explain what's going on in their brains is Jonah Berger of the University of Pennsylvania. This sort of internalized form of herd behavior is part of what we call social learning. Starting at a very early age, when we see members of our group perform a task, our brains literally reward us for following in their footsteps. When I saw everybody stand up, I felt like I needed to join them. Otherwise, I'm like excluded. Once I decided to go with it, then I felt much more comfortable. Conformity is how we become socialized, but it can also cause us to develop bad habits or repeat past wrongs. And it's why even this rebel who wasn't standing for any of this nonsense, eventually joined the ranks. 
And the only thing more shocking than seeing how easily conformity affects the way you act What do you think? I think it's very plausible for it to happen. Yeah. Why do people, so why do we just go along with the crowd? You know, I heard him say social conformity, but in the context of what we're talking about in this class about negotiating, the fundamental thing that you must know in every aspect of your life is what's your what? What do you think? What do you think you need to know? So that you don't just stand up and society or other people tell you to do so. You have to know your why. What's your why? Why, and that's why you're doing it. Yeah, and then your nose. You have to, well, I was trying to get, but why is an excellent answer too. <laughs> you, know, you have to know why you're doing stuff, right? And part of knowing why, you have to know what I'm not going to do this. Because people basically social conform you right into a situation where you're doing dumb stuff and you don't even know what you're doing. Yes. Uh, so I, that that video that shows the, I like the ABS because I'm just looking at it. Exactly. Absorb the attention, bypass the critical factor, stimulate unconscious response. Exactly. That's why every single time I'm showing you stuff, if you go back, why? Because repetition is boring. No, repetition is the mother of skill. That's how you learn the alphabet. That's how you learn anything. So every time I'm showing you something, you can see how it goes over and over and over again. Very important. So that's exactly the point. That's why we do things we, we don't wanna do. And we're in relationships that we don't want to have because often we're on automatic pilot as opposed to designing the life we want and the relationships we want. Can I add something really quick? Professor, that story, something similar happened to me recently. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, it was the day for the Democratic primaries, for the primaries in general. Yeah. And so I went in and um, before I went, I researched my candidates and I wrote down like most of what I wanted because there's a lot of stuff going on. So I put it on like this yellow sticky so I can remember the names of the people who I want to vote for. Because I thought to myself, I never see people voting and everyone already knows what they're voting for. But there were so many different things. So I made like a small note to myself. And when I took my ballot and went into my little corner, I pulled my note out and I started looking for the people that I liked. Okay. And people were looking at me very strange. <laughs> like, what is she doing? But the truth is, I've never seen anyone do that before. But then I'm like, how do you remember all these people? How do you know exactly who? And now they have this new rank thing, yeah. rank them first, second, third. And I, I'm just like, look, I have to do what I have to do. But then it made me think now, who are these people voting for? Like, do you, are these people memorizing everyone that they, they like? Like, how do you remember these people? So it just, we just follow because, you know, I'm, I'm not young, but I followed my mom to vote and my, 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 my dad to vote. And I just do what they do. Yes. You go in, you take your pen, take your ballot, you shade in your area, don't let anybody see who, who you're voting for and, and, and all that stuff that you can't do, but what can you do? So we were just following blindly and you show up and then at some point in time, you're gonna get to a part where you don't know any or these people are, you're, you're gambling. I didn't wanna gamble this time, so I made a list. And the people around me were kind of shocked when I pulled out my list and I'm like, well, shame on you guys. Who are you guys voting for? Because I, how do you guys remember? You're guessing. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna guess this time. So I decided to take my little tool with me. Now, I do not know whether or not that's allowed, but I just decided that I wanted to do that because how do you remember all of these candidates and, and, what, and what they represent? But the fact is, I've never seen anyone look at anything for reference when they're voting. Like, how do you remember? That's a very good point. Well, how do, how do we know things? How do we know about, like, who are we voting for? How does, how, ABS, how does a system get you to vote, um, vote in a way that's not necessarily in alignment, even you don't have to know. How do they get you to do that? 
Anybody? Mm -hmm. Up until now, people, it's a very good point she points out because that's part of that's part of the uh, on the forensic artist. That's that's part of the whole shtick, if you will. How do they get us to do it? How about this? If you're a Democrat, you vote everybody who's what? Democratic. If you're Republican, you vote everybody who's what? Republican. Republican. Green Party, all green. A B S formula. And you'll actually fight anybody who says, why are you analyzing the candidate? Why are you doing that? <laughs> why are you doing that? It's called confirmation bias. I believe this about that group. That's why I said you never, you have to deal with everybody in the way that you see them and they come to you. Because they're unique. Mm -hmm. Very important. Remember I told you, if you think of everybody as a group, that's the best way to discriminate against them all the time. You've got to look at a person and see their significance. The one tool in negotiation you must never forget, I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. And you may not say, well, what? I've talked to all kinds of Republicans, Democrats, you don't know my thing. I had a meeting with Eric Adams, I think he's gonna be the mayor, about five or six years ago. He won't remember it. <laughs> but it was only about five of us in a private meeting. Wait, wait, Eric Adams? Yeah, about five years ago. Private, private meeting with someone who's very, very controversial. And uh, we did that meeting. More meetings all the time with people. Mm -hmm. E to influencing them is to what? Make them what? Like everybody else, or do I make them feel what? Significant, absolutely. I'm with the police commissioner. Yes. 10 of us are on the Zoom call like this. Like maybe it's the same number of people we have right on the Zoom call. Do I just say stupid things or do I make sure he seems and feels what? Significant. He's gonna remember my group. He's gonna remember what I'm advocating for. Listen to me. I'm telling you, <laughs> I don't do it like that. I'm telling you this now, just came up. I wouldn't have said anything because Ms. Powell, Mass Powell didn't bring it up. I would never have mentioned it. I use this for real. If you do that, one aspect of it, making sure you make sure the person feels significant, not fake them, not say, oh, that's a nice purple tie. Right? <laughs> person knows you're kissing their butt, then, then it's gonna actually have the reverse impact. But if, if you really wanna influence people, um, that's the way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so that was important. I'm glad you mentioned that, Ms. Powell. Okay, we saw that. I have another quick, I don't know if I have time. I think I do 40, 15 plus 40 is uh, 10, 55. So I'm going to, I'm going to, can I show you? Did, I, did you guys also see the thing about the, the guy who talks to the Klan members? Did I show you that one? Uh, no. No, let's watch that one. Because I want you to see what you've learned right now. Just being a, he didn't know any of the stuff you know, but you know more than him. Let's see how much of an impact you can do. Let's see it right away. Let's do that. That's not the video because I don't have time. Let's get rid of this one. Let's get rid of this one here. I don't want to do that. Here we go. Let's watch it. What do you do when people don't like you? So a black guy walks into a bar. Sounds like the beginning of a, of a bad joke. I see people shifting around a little bit, but it gets better. And the first thing he sees is everybody else in there is white. So he sits down at the piano on the stage with the band to play. And on the band break, a white gentleman comes up to him and says, you know, this is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. Well, the black pianist tries to explain the black origin of boogie woogie, rockabilly, and rock and roll to this gentleman, but he didn't buy it. But he wanted to buy this black guy a drink. So they went back to the table. He had a beer, the black guy had a cranberry juice, and they began talking. And then the white gentleman says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down 
and had a drink with the black man. Well, the first thing that occurs to the black guy is, this guy is having a night of first. And when he asked the white gentleman why, how can that be, the white gentleman revealed that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, this guy was having a night of first. My first experience with racism occurred when I was 10 years old in 1968. My family had just moved to a place called Belmont, Massachusetts. And I was one of two black kids in my entire school, 10 years old in fourth grade. I joined the Cub Scouts, and we had a parade, a march, from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts, to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. Somewhere down the parade route, as I was marching with my fellow scouts, I began getting hit by bottles, soda pop cans, rocks, and debris from the street by a small group of white spectators off to my right on the sidewalk. I had no idea that I was the only person getting hit until my den mother and other scout leaders came rushing over and huddled over me with their bodies and escorted me out of the danger. And they never explained why this was happening to me. And I had no clue. When I got home, my mom and dad were fixing me up with Band-Aids and Mercurochrome, and they explained to me why I was a target of these projectiles. At the age of 10, I formed a question in my mind, and that question was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? So years later, here I am, a college graduate with my degree in music, and I'm sitting at a bar at a table with a member of the KKK. I'd been seeking the answer to that question for years, unable to find it. Now, here's my opportunity. For who better to ask than someone who would join an organization who historically, their premise has been hating those who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe? Who better to answer that question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? I persuaded this Klan member to give me the contact information for the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. He reluctantly provided it to me on the condition that I not reveal where I got it from. The Klan leader's name was Roger Kelly. I had my secretary contact Roger Kelly because I decided I want to write a book. I want to sit down and, and, uh, and interview Klan leaders and Klan members all around the country and ask them that question. So I was going to start right there in Maryland, where I currently live. So I had her contact Roger Kelly and not tell him that I was black, but ask him if he would consent to sitting down with her boss and giving him an interview. Give him. So he agreed. I arranged a hotel room for us to meet in. And when he arrived with his armed bodyguard, they were shocked to see that I was black. And I could see apprehension on them. And I stood up and went like this to show I had nothing in my hands and invited them in. They came in. Mr. Kelly took a seat. And, and the bodyguard stood at attention to his right. He had his sidearm right here in his holster. And we started this interview process. Everything was going along fine. He let me know that indeed I was inferior due to the color of my skin. That made me inferior. But I wasn't there to fight with him. I was there to learn from him where these perceptions came from. Because in order to address something, you have to learn how they got there in the first place. So I'm listening. A little while later into this interview, a strange noise occurred, kind of a and we all jumped. And my eyes locked with Roger Kelly's eyes. I knew he had made that noise, because I didn't make it. And my eyes were silently asking him, what did you just do? Well, his eyes had fixated on mine, and he was silently asking me the same question. The bodyguard had his hand on his gun, looking back and forth between the Klan leader and myself, silently asking, what did either one of you all just do? Well, my secretary realized what had happened. She had filled the ice bucket with ice and put cans of soda in there to be hospitable enough for everybody beverages. Well, 
the ice bucket was sitting on top of the dresser. The ice had begun melting, and the cans of soda cascaded down the ice. And that's what made the noise. And we all began laughing at how ignorant we all were. But this was a teaching moment. I won't say anything was learned at that moment, but a lesson was taught. And that lesson was this. All because some foreign, and underscore or highlight the word foreign, entity of which we were ignorant, that being the bucket of ice and cans of soda, entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made, we became fearful and accusatory of each other. Thus, ignorance breeds fear. If we don't keep that fear in check, that fear in turn will breed hatred because we hate those things that frighten us. If we do not keep that hatred in check, that hatred will breed destruction. We want to destroy those things that frighten us and that we hate. But guess what? They may have been harmless and we were just ignorant. So we saw the whole chain almost unravel to completion had the bodyguard drawn his gun and destroyed either myself or my secretary. So like I said, we all began laughing and carried on with the interview and there were no more problems. Over time, Mr. Kelly would come down to my house and continue these interviews. He would even have dinner and lunch at my table or we would go out and have dinner and lunch. Now this was somebody who considered himself superior and me inferior. We continued this relationship he did not invite me to his house. But after a couple of years, he began inviting me to his home. I would see his clan den, and I'd take some pictures and some more notes for my book. Then he began inviting me to clan rallies. I'd go to these clan rallies and watch these clansmen and clanswomen in their robes and hoods parade around this big 20 to 30 foot cross, set it on fire, and it goes whoosh. And they parade around and give all these lectures, take some more pictures and notes. Well, CNN wanted to do a story on this. They knew who I was through music, and they knew who Roger Kelly was through the Klan. So I'm, I'm going to show you this clip that was shown every hour for 24 hours on CNN and on HLN all over the world. And I want you to pay particular attention to what Mr. Kelly says. He says that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan, because his views on the Klan had been cemented in his mind for years. And then he goes on to say how he believes in separation of the races. But also listen to what he says about respect. And then listen to the commentary at the end that the two CNN anchor people give. Show the video, please. Welcome to this final hour of CNN Sunday Morning. I'm Bob Kane, and today for Miles O'Brien. Good morning to you all. I'm Joey Chad. Friendship can transcend all kinds of boundaries. Just look at us. And two men in Washington <laughs> area are showing that even an African-American man and a member of the Ku Klux Klan can find common ground. CNN's Carl Rochelle for Cheryl Davis plays a hot piano. It's part of the show, and it makes him stand out. He also stands out here. Davis is one of the few African-Americans you will ever find attending a KKK rally. More than attending, he is welcome. I got more respect for that black man than I do you white niggers All out right. there. It's been a tough day for the Klan. Their Maryland rally found many local residents rejecting the message of white separatism. After it's over, Daryl Davis hangs around backstage with his friend, Klan wizard Roger Kelly. Huh? It's not unusual for blacks and whites to be friends, but it is unusual to find a black man and a Klan leader chatting pleasantly over an orange soda after a Klan rally. The relationship started over a book Davis was writing. His secretary set up an interview with Roger Kelly, but didn't tell him Davis was black. They talked and talked some more. Davis learning about the Klan, Kelly learning about Davis. We get to know one another and we do different things, you know, it's... It hasn't changed my views about the Klan, you know, because my views on the Klan has been pretty much cemented in my mind for years. Kelly and his Klan friends go to hear Davis and his band. Hello, 
and Davis goes to their rallies. I sat on, on, on the front row and, uh, and listened to each all times and speak. Um, some things I agreed with, other things I did not agree with. Davis thinks that his presence promotes badly needed understanding. Hate stems, I believe, from fear. From fear of the unknown. And I think this is all across the board, regardless of whether it's the Klansman or anything else. But he has no illusions about the Klan. If he did, his friend would be quick to disabuse them. And I believe in separation of the races. I believe that's in the best interest of all races. Does he really? Or has friendship transcended the color barrier? Listen to Kelly at a Klan rally. I'm a follower up man to hell him back, because I believe in what he stands for and he believes in what I stand for. A lot of times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I respect him to sit down and listen to him. The strange relationship of a KKK wizard and his black buddy. In Washington, I'm Carl Rochelle, CNN Sunday morning. Strange. Good adjective. Strange. Certainly that. Okay. You heard the Klan leader say that he respected me. What's up with that? He's a Klan leader. I'm a black guy. He said, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me, and I respect him to sit down and listen to him. Very important, folks. If you have an adversary, you don't have to respect what they're saying, but respect their right to say it and have that conversation. We spend too much time talking about each other at each other, past each other, and not enough time talking with each other. That is respect, okay? And as, thank you, as a result, as a result of that respect, over time, Mr. Kelly began rethinking his ideology and that cement that held his ideas together in his mind for so long began to crack and crumble and then fall apart. And then just a few years back, Mr. Kelly decided to give up the Ku Klux Klan. He renounced it and gave me his robe and hood. This is the robe of the Klan leader, right here. This is the same robe you saw him wearing in the video. And of course, this is the hood and mask. Keep in mind, when two enemies are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. They might be yelling and screaming, but at least they're talking. It's when the talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So keep the conversation going. People learn racism through dialogue. Somebody tells them about it. So if you can learn it through dialogue, you can also unlearn it through dialogue. So a black guy walks into a bar, sits down at the piano, and then a conversation starts. What do you think? Interesting, right? We only have a few minutes, but I wanted to let you guys know, don't think for one moment the stuff that you're learning here is not impactful. He didn't know 10% of what you learned in this class so far. And if you're willing, if you're committed, you can bring love out of anybody, if you're loving, if you're compassionate. The choice is guess who? Ours. So I want to leave you with that. Hope everybody's okay. I'm going to send some more notices about the um, paper because people are going to know about that. I have to get ready for the next class, but I wanted to make sure you all knew and saw what you're learning in a real, real life way. It's not theory. This is reality. And it can change other people's lives and most importantly, your own. Okay? Thank you, everybody. See you soon and have a beautiful, as my mother would say, a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Bye now. Bye. Thank you, Professor.